In today's video, we're going to do a deep dive into the design of this engine right here. This is an Edwards Motor Company engine made in the early 1920s. I recently uploaded a video on another one of these that if you want to go check it out, I'll have a link for it up here in the corner on whichever side it's on. And I was really rushed in that video. I was pretty happy with how it turned out, but I missed a lot of key components on how this engine functioned. Now that video is sitting at like 250,000 views and there's a lot of people asking questions that don't quite understand how it works, as well as a bunch of other things. So today's video, thanks to the fact of Movie Magic, I have another one right here. This one is just a parts engine, but it's torn down all the way so I can show you a bunch of the ways that everything functions and hopefully get a better detail on how it works. Feel free to skip through the video wherever you want questions answered. I'm going to try and leave chapters describe where everything's at. Please stick around. I hope you guys enjoy and let's get into it. So for a quick overview, this is an Edwards Motor Company engine made in the early 1920s. Edwards Motor Company only made one model of engine and this is it. There was a couple different variations of it. Some had igniters, some had spark plugs. Mine is an early piston trip ignited version, which I'll explain later in the video. This engine can be ran at one and a half horsepower on one cylinder or six horsepower at two cylinders. It gets away with this by having two separate carburetors, one for each cylinder. This engine is water cooled. The hopper holds the water all the way around the cylinder jackets and in the head and it works by the temperature difference of the hot water to the cold water and it'll just kind of stir around in there and when it starts to boil it gets as hot as it can because water will start to evaporate and stay at 212 degrees Fahrenheit as it boils. This engine has a low tension ignition system, meaning it has igniters and a low tension magneto to generate electricity. What makes this engine unique from most igniter engines is it's a piston trip igniter engine. So each cylinder has an igniter, but there's no linkages on the outside of the engine to trip the igniter. The way they get away with this is if we come over to the pistons here, they have this stud coming out of the top. And the way that it works is if you see here, I have my fingers. If you imagine both my fingers are the points on the igniter, it'll come up and tap them open right before top dead center and fire the engine. Now since we have the pistons, we might as well come over here and look. You can see there's a hole on the top of the piston. That's to catch oil from the cylinder lubricators to lubricate the wrist pin. But it has a little extension slot on the end there. That's so you can get extra oil into that cup. And if you come down here and look at the cup, the cup has two holes in the bottom of it, one to oil the wrist pin, and one will go into this little brass tube on the connecting rod, and that'll follow the tube all the way down and lubricate your rod bearing. You don't have to have any grease cups on them or any way to lubricate them. They're lubricated automatically with the cylinder. Now this engine is a two-cylinder engine with the cylinders firing 180 degrees out from each other. And that's nothing new or different. John Deere did that for decades, and that's how all of their tractors worked until they moved on to four cylinders. But what makes this engine kind of unusual with that concept is this crankshaft itself doesn't have a flywheel on the outside. What they ended up doing, as you can see, is the flywheel's in the middle. Now, I'm going to take this one out here so you can get a better look at it, but there's a very unusual way in how they attach this flywheel. So this is the flywheel on the engine. It's in between both throws, so you got one cylinder here and one cylinder on this side. Now what makes this unusual is the way they decided to attach this. As you can see, it has two bolts on this side, one here, one here. And then on the other side, there's two bolts here. These are 5 16 bolts, I believe. I'm gonna bring you guys in closer so you can kind of see this. So as you can see, these two screws are right here and there's two on the bottom as well from how you're looking at it. And then this piece right here, you can see the seam is your crankshaft throw in between one and two on the cylinders because the one throw is on this side and one's over here. What's holding this on is these four bolts are just set screwed so more or less pinching that throw. And the only way this doesn't rattle off is they fill this whole seam with lead, as you can see here. This is lead. Actually, I'm going to go get a wire brush so you can see that that's lead. I'll be right back. Oh, that's way more obvious. So as you can see, this seam in the middle here is a gap. That is, without this lead in here, when they first bolt this in with these set screws, this is an air gap between this flywheel and that crankshaft. So what they do is they fill this whole seam with lead, and then they take a chisel in here and smack inward on that lead, causing it to spread out and tighten against the flywheel. That is all that keeps this flywheel hurtling around in there at 600 RPM. It's kind of insane that they got away with that. But there's a lot of these engines out there that ended up having that fail and this flywheel comes loose. I've seen a couple of them where they've been welded back on. 
which I don't know what that does for the stress or straightness of your crankshaft, but that's not my problem because neither of my engines had that issue. So if you ever pick one of these engines up, that's something you should definitely check is that this is still tight. If not, you're gonna have to try and report and make it look good. I just wanted to point that out because that's such an unusual concept to just lead in a flywheel. It's very similar to like, uh, what is that, lead and lead and oakum plumbing? I don't do plumbing, but it's like the old cast iron plumbing where you fill it with a rope and then put lead in it and then pound the lead in to seal it. It's a very similar concept, very unusual and definitely not something we do nowadays. So here I have one of the heads out of the engine. And as you see, I have this all color coded. I'm hoping this is gonna make sense. My engine didn't come with the rocker arm assembly or the carburetor housing, which is what goes on top of the head here. So I made up this temporary thing because I don't want to take apart my good running engine to try and do this because it's all pinned together and it's all delicate and I don't feel like breaking it. So I'm hoping all this will come through and make some sort of sense. As you can see here, you've got four valves. If I push this off to the side here, we got four valves. These two are each cylinder's exhaust valve. The mufflers are right here on the normal engine facing me at the moment. So these are your exhaust valves, they go to your exhaust ports. These two are your intake valves, they go to these two holes, which on the valve cover is your carburetors, the two separate carburetors that run the engine independently. So if we come over here now, I've got this color coded, one cylinder's red and one cylinder's green, so we can hopefully keep track of them. I'm not sure how well you guys are gonna see this motion very good, I'm gonna try to make it as clear as possible but we're gonna do this slow and pretty simple. So this engine has a very unique valve train system as it has two push rods for operating four separate valves. It only has two rocker arms as well. And the way it gets away with this is it uses the push rods as also pull rods. So when you push on the push rod, it'll open one valve, and when you pull on it, it opens a different valve. And it rests in the middle for the combustion cycle. A lot of people were getting this confused with the desmodromic system, like what a Ducati has, and the way that mechanically opens and closes the valve, so there's no real valve spring or valve float problems. That's not how this works at all. It has regular valve springs and everything. And if you look real close here, I was gonna try and explain it with my colored one, but it didn't really work out very well. But I slowed this video from my last video down. And as you can see, if you watch it closely, the left cylinder will push to open the exhaust valve and pull to open the intake valve. Meanwhile, if you go to the right cylinder, it will pull to open the exhaust valve and push to open the intake valve. So now I've got the cam assembly out of my parts engine to show you guys a little bit better how these cam rollers and push rods work. I'm going to take this cam gear off so you can see what the cam rockers look like because each cam rocker has two different rollers on it. And the way it times all these valves up is the cam gear itself has two separate lobes on it. One controls both intake cycles on both rockers and the other one controls both exhaust cycles. So it only needs two lobes to operate four valves because as you can see, each rocker is 90 degrees off from each other. So now I'm gonna take this whole assembly and mark out what each spot in the cam system works like functionally on the engine. And as you can see here, I have it all labeled out, and I hope this helps you make sense of it all. If you need to compare with this section and the earlier section, please do, as I wasn't finding any better ways to describe how this functions. There's a couple different things I didn't mention in this video that I mentioned in my other video, such as how this engine is started, as well as a couple other quirks that it had back in the day, so I highly recommend going to check that out. I know there's going to be stuff about this engine that I wanted to mention in this video that I've forgotten about by this time. If there's anything you want to know otherwise about this engine that I don't mention in this video or the other video, please leave a comment down below. I'd love to answer any questions you have about it. This is a really unique engine. I'm really happy that I own one of them and I'd like to find myself a spark plug one at some point down the road. I think that's gonna pretty much wrap it up for this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below. If you had any questions, like I said, leave a comment. If you like hit and miss engine and old machine related content, I try to upload as often as I can. Please consider subscribing down below and I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time. You have a nice day.